So LTC, Models for Change, is a two-year professional development project that gives library workers access to free training and community leadership techniques such as coalition building and dialogue facilitation. And this image that you see on screen lays out the learning schedule for the entire series focused on academic libraries. In addition to the three webinars in this series, you may wish to check out the previous series for larger and urban public libraries and the upcoming series for smaller and rural libraries, which will take place in spring 2018. All of these webinars are open to all types of libraries, but have specific focus areas. Following the three webinars in this series, there'll be an opportunity to dig deeper with the National Issues Forum model by participating in a free pre-conference workshop at the ALA Midwinter Conference in February 2018. More on that at the close of this webinar. Before I introduce today's presenters, I'd like to say just a bit about what ALA is hoping to achieve with this series. Libraries of all types have been active in the work of community engagement for years, and the ALA Public Programs Office in particular has worked with academic libraries for years to tour and develop exhibits, discussion series, festivals, and other program models. Libraries of all types, and certainly academic libraries, work very hard at outreach, targeting underserved segments of campus and community life, developing, communicating, and advocating for use of library resources and space. But what we've been hearing from the field, though, is that there are ways to enhance outreach through specific approaches, approaches to engagement, and fundamental to engagement is the ability to foster dialogue. Now, our hope is that you'll leave today's intro webinar to the work of dialogue and deliberation, thinking about your role and your institution's role in engaging your community, and intrigued enough to explore some of the models that we're able to provide training in. And we are so lucky to have two experts in this work to guide us today representing the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation, and a voice from outside the library field is Courtney Breeze, Managing Director of the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation. We're so happy to have her and NCDD as our partner in this initiative. In addition to directing NCDD's ongoing programming, its many projects, and its biennial national conferences, she is a trained dialogue and deliberation facilitator, trainer, and mediator with extensive experience in the National Issues Forums framework. Courtney has also worked with the Massachusetts Office of Public Collaboration, training and managing their mediation programs. And from within the academic library field, someone who may be familiar to many of you for her leadership in the field at large, and specifically as a leader in the library-led community engagement world is Nancy Chronic. Currently, Nancy teaches community engagement, information policy, and intellectual freedom at the Rutgers University School of Communication and Information and works on special projects with Rutgers University Libraries. She has convened community conversations and deliberative forums at Rutgers and elsewhere and speaks and writes about this work, including her 2010 article, Academic Libraries as Hubs for Deliberative Democracy, published in the Journal of Public Deliberation, special issue on higher education and deliberative democracy. Nancy has been a valuable advisor to this initiative for years and has compiled a wonderful bibliography to accompany this webinar. And you've already received links to that bibliography in another handout, and they'll also be available on the project website. Thank you, Nancy and Courtney, for being with us. I'm going to pass the mic over to Courtney, who will get us started this afternoon. Great. Thanks, Mary. Hi, everyone. This is Courtney Brees. Uh, it is a pleasure to be talking with you all today. So before we get started, I just want to uh, quickly review our agenda for today. In this webinar, we're going to start off by talking about what we mean by engagement and how libraries are currently engaging, uh, particularly in a higher education setting. We'll talk a little bit about dialogue and deliberation. Uh, and how you can use these tools and the methods we'll be featuring today. 
we'll share some stories with you of how dialogue and deliberation have been used in higher education uh, and certainly some examples from libraries. And we'll talk about the elements uh, that it takes for success in any dialogue and deliberation efforts. We'll wrap up by introducing you to our two partners and our models for this, um, this webinar series, Essential Partners and National Issues Forum. And then we'll share some resources with you and of course answer your questions. So just to get us started, um, if you haven't heard of the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation yet, um, NCDD, as we like to go by, because um, our name is quite long and a little bit of a, a tongue twister at times, we are a network of innovators who help communities have better conversations and make decisions on some of today's toughest issues. So NCDD serves as a resource clearinghouse, a news source, and a facilitative leader for this community of practice. You can learn more about NCVD um, and also, of course, check out our latest news and resources in public engagement, dialogue, and deliberation by going to our website. And Samantha has just shared that with you in the chat. It's ncvd.org. So NCVD's membership um, is spread across the country in just about every state. You can see that on the map here that I'm showing you. Um, and we also have members in about 30 other countries as well. We are, if you look at this map closely, um, and you can look at it more closely at the link that's just been shared in the chat as well. Um, it's a Google map, so you can do, you know, zoom into your area and take a look. Um, we have members working in many different arenas, some work in government, some are private consultants and facilitators, but you'll see those green little buildings, those are all our members that work in higher education. Uh, so we have a very big representation amongst our network already who are folks working in higher ed. The NCVD network is a great resource that I want to make sure you're all aware of um, and is something that's available to you as you explore these new methods for engagement. So feel free um, to take a look at that map at the link in the chat when you have some time and see who else um, might be near you who's working in these areas. So in addition to NCDD's network of practitioners, um, we are also very committed to helping to introduce new methods of engagement to anyone and everyone who is interested in learning more about them. And so one of the ways we're doing that right now is this partnership with ALA on the Models for Change initiative. We also are doing a lot of work with students. Um, this image that you see here is actually from our 2014 conference and it includes um, our founding director, Sandy Heyerbacher. She's the uh, wonderful woman in red in the middle of the picture. Um, and she's flanked by students on either side from uh, Colorado State University and their Center for Public Deliberation. We love working with students because we see the potential um, and the opportunity to really um, you know, build their skills and develop the next generation of leaders who are going to help bring engagement in our communities to the next level. So today's webinar is particularly special to me um, because my start in this work began actually as an undergraduate student at Franklin Pierce University, which is based in New Hampshire. I had the incredible benefit of being introduced to deliberation in my freshman seminar course, actually. Um, it was taught by the then director of the New England Center for Civic Life, which is a center based at the university. As part of um, this course, there was a service learning component. So all freshmen went through a service learning component in their freshman seminar. And my classmates and I, in this particular section, learned to moderate deliberative dialogue using the National Issues Framework, and we completed the course by moderating dialogues with high school students. So the photos you see here are not actually from that experience. Um, this is from my first real job immediately following my undergraduate experience, um, moderating a national issue forum at uh, the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where I went to work immediately following my undergraduate education. So this is a forum that I moderated with students, faculty, and staff at the university. So back at Franklin Pierce, the, the Center for Civic Life um, 
was a very active part of the campus. It partnered with many faculty and staff on campus, including staff from the library. Uh, forums were held each semester on a couple of different topics. They were often related to courses in the core curriculum or other timely topics that were coming up in the world or on campus. Uh, the center also responded to issues that emerged on campus in real time that called for conversations, such as issues of racism, uh, student drinking, and, and some other things um, in the time that I spent at Franklin Pierce. For me, this experience as a student really shaped my views of what engagement can and should be, and ultimately led me to focus my career on helping others realize the difference between our most common forms of discourse, such as debate, and quality dialogue. So I love that you as academic librarians are interested in learning some new approaches to engaging your campus community, because I know firsthand how impactful these efforts can be on your students and certainly on the campus community as well. So to get us started, um, let's talk a little bit about what you are doing already. I know in the pre-webinar survey um, that we had shared with you, we asked you a question about your library's current strategies for addressing the needs of your community. So I'm just gonna ask you um, that again. And if you take a moment now, share with us in the chat some of your current approaches to addressing community needs. And while we wait for you to do that, I'll, I'll note a couple things that I certainly noticed um, in your earlier responses. Um, for instance, certainly uh, you shared with us that you are doing a lot of outreach work. Um, you're seeking feedback from people, you're looking for information on what they need, and that is great. You know, that really, um, I imagine can help you learn what are some of the most popular topics for discussion going on on your campus right now. And I see some others that are coming in right now. That's great. Some folks are doing advisory panels, looking for grants and partners. Partnership is always key, isn't it? Hosting dialogues and programs on current issues of interest, yeah. Absolutely. Outside speakers, yep, we certainly heard a lot about um, hosting panels, um, speaker programs, perhaps uh, film screenings, um, or different, different ways that you're bringing new information, you know, knowledge and experiences in for your campus community, that's great. Offering display, display space, rather, to outside groups, sure. This is fantastic. Thank you all for sharing. Oh, I see one of you is providing um, programs with the local public library and hosting forum discussions between campus and local community. That's fantastic. Ah, and some of you are talking about what's possible. Great. One other thing I noticed in your pre-surveys that I just want to mention is um, some of you mentioned that your approaches can be reactive, you know, if something emerges um, that needs, really calls for some programming or conversation, um, you'll pull it together um, versus being proactive and identifying things in advance. Um, you know, what you're sharing with us now in the chat, and I unfortunately can't go over all of them because I want to keep us moving, um, and what we heard from you in the pre-survey are all different types and, uh, and approaches to engagement. Um, you're going to hear us say engagement a lot in today's webinar, and really what we mean when we talk about engagement or community engagement, it really just means inviting people to participate and contribute to the improvement of their community. And that can happen in numerous ways. You know, how you do that will vary, and it depends on your needs and the needs of your community. So sometimes that is proactive and planned in advance. You know that there's a topic coming up um, in courses or you know, my example at Franklin Pierce, we had a core curriculum where there was, there was always a, a topic that could come up each semester that we knew we could hold forums on. Um, sometimes 
you have to react and put something together on short notice. A, an issue emerges on campus and you can recognize there's a need to talk about it and so you react to that. Those are all great things. What we will be talking about today in this webinar series are some new models for engagement that you can use in different situations and will help you to address your goals and your mission. So to give you some ideas of engagement efforts from other academic libraries, I've pulled together a couple of really great examples um, off of the programming librarian page, and we'll share the links to each of these with you in just a moment. But just to briefly touch on these, um, the, the first image at the top left uh, of the slide is from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And at Amherst, librarians launched the Talking Truth series which brought students and the broader community together to examine climate disruption, as well as the impact that it has on people as individuals. So they held discussions each semester and those were tied to books, to films, or to other prompts. The image at the far right um, is from the librarians at American University's Bender Library, who organized the Exploring Social Justice series. So this program brought speakers to campus to talk about social justice work, and in uh, complements with that, they built a discussion guide to create um, dialogue, to promote dialogue, rather, at events uh, in the classroom and also online. And finally, the image in the middle comes from the University Library at the University of Michigan. Uh, they spent a year exploring interracial and multiracial issues. They held a faculty panel talking about how multiracialism had impacted their lives and their work, as well as a student panel and a film series. So I'm gonna hand things over to Nancy for a little bit here to talk more about what ac academic libraries are doing. Great. Thanks, Courtney. Courtney, can you hand me the presentation? Anyway, I'm delighted to be here today. I'm just so pleased that so many of you have joined us. I see we, we hit 142, which is amazing. Um, but I'm also really pleased to be here, not just as a, as a long-term member of the American Library Association, but also as a member of NCDD, which I've had uh, the great opportunity to work with Courtney and Sandy for a long time. But I also work with Joni Dougherty, who was, who's now at the Kettering Foundation, uh, hosting a libraries and the public project with several libraries in the country. But also Joni was that person that uh, introduced this work to uh, Courtney at Franklin Pierce. So it's a small world of people who do this work. And um, like I said, I'm delighted that you're joining us and that we have a chance uh, to um, share with you some of our own experiences as well as get a sense of the work you're doing in this arena. So let me start off by saying that uh, since the turn of this century, higher education institutions have both prioritized and we embrace the important civic mission in revitalizing democracy. And they see our, our current situation in this world, our divided states of America, as, um, as one of the key reasons that they really need to reintroduce students and the whole higher education enterprise to the ideas behind what democracy is really about and how we can bring people together and work together as citizens in this country. So I think you'll agree there is no better time than now for this work. So it's not just most of our higher education institutions, and I urge you to find out what's going on on your campus, but it's also our higher education organizations that are out really promoting civic learning. Uh, groups like the Association of American Colleges and Universities, the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, which we know as ASCU, a little bit shorter like NCDD, a little bit easier to say, and their American Democracy Project, which has had lots of librarians involved, the American Association of Community Colleges, the American Association of University Pre Professors, and then some collaborative efforts by these groups like Campus Compact, 
which had a whole other series this year at their conference, and the Democracy Imperative, a group that focuses specifically on deliberative dialogue in higher education. So uh, Mary mentioned an article I wrote um, in 2010. That article was actually uh, edited, part of a series, by Nancy Thomas, who um, is now at Tufts University. Um, and uh, Tufts has an Institute for Democracy and Higher Education. And in her article for um, one uh, a similar uh, collection that she put together earlier, she said that practicing the arts of democracy can be infused across disciplines, and it can be built into nearly all structures on campus, such as student clubs and activities, athletic programs, cultural and intellectual events, residential life, and volunteer opportunities. There are no venues on campus that could not be, uh, could not be practice grounds for democracy. Now, unfortunately, she did not mention the L word, and that's the academic library in her list. And when she asked me to do an article about this, I looked around, and quite frankly, I couldn't find a whole lot of academic libraries that were um, venues for practicing democracy either. Um, so I think it's really um, an indication of how far we've come in the last few years that so many of you are interested in this work. And uh, hopefully you will get involved in the way that uh, some of us have and see how important and um, useful it can be as tools for engaging people on your campus and beyond. So here is a um, diagram from that uh, same issue, uh, 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 public deliberation, that was put together by Martin Carcasson, who I think you're going to meet if you uh, come to the in-person training in February. Martin's at Colorado State and has this incredible core of young students doing this work. He's very inspiring. Anyway, he put together this diagram about all the disciplines, on, or a lot of the disciplines on campus, and the ways they're actively engaged in some form of civic engagement. So I'm at Rutgers, and here at Rutgers, we've got education scholars that are working with our public schools. And the ESL group um, actually offers classes at the public library. Um, our business school actually um, works with the public library as well in providing free tax clinics um, in both Spanish and English, which is very impressive since the community is mostly Spanish speaking. Um, and we also have a wonderful service learning group on campus called the Collaborative that focuses on civic engagement as well. And they place students in all kinds of um, uh, community-based agencies to help uh, the community advance. So can you identify some uh, similar activities on your campus based either on these subject fields or other subject fields that you know are going on? I'll let you type them in if you know of any. So since we are, most of us, I guess, academic librarians, many of us serve as library liaisons. And we are liaisons to these various departments. So clearly, there's lots of opportunities here for us to jump in simply as liaisons to work with those people that are already engaged in the community, a great way to build partnerships and not have to start from scratch. So here at Rutgers, we have the Eagleton Institute for Politics. They have a wonderful youth engagement program that helps young people both at Rutgers and in the high schools develop a sense of civic agency. So a couple of their students came to me and said, we really need some help with civic literacy. We're doing these projects about local political issues, but we can't seem to find any information about those issues locally. It's really hard for us. So after I helped them, I got invited to their team event at the end of the semester, and I found that all the other teams had the same problem they were really having trouble uh, figuring out how to learn about local information. So clearly, ding dong, you know, an opportunity uh, that existed for us. So just what kind of role should academic libraries have in this kind of work? 
A couple of years ago, George Mahaffey, who is the vice president of ASCU, that American Association of State Colleges and Universities, he, he came to speak at the ALA Legislative Day to academic librarians. And he spoke on the topic, developing informed and engaged citizens, the imperative for higher education. And in that uh, talk, he talked about why he sees academic libraries as citizenship centers more relevant now than ever in history. Now, I know all of us as academic librarians always like when some people in our, field, in our world of higher ed think we're more relevant than ever. So maybe this is a time for you to think about, well, what roles do you see your libraries playing? in regard to civic learning and community engagement. So why don't you go ahead and put some of your ideas into the text box. I know a few of you have already talked about some opportunities on campus. Um, and in the pre-survey, a few of you have talked about some kinds of roles, but I want to see what you see as the role for the library. Clearly, if 142 of you have signed up today, you recognize that there is a role for academic libraries in this work. So I'd love to hear more about what you see as the potential here. A trusted neutral unit on campus seen as fair and belonging to everyone. Bingo, a really important uh, idea is a place that's neutral, a place that can bring people together. Great, yes, belongs to everyone. How about some others? Public library is also a great resource for this, absolutely. And if you tuned into our earlier um, uh, series, we talked a lot about the role of public libraries as well. A place where it's okay to ask questions and challenge assumptions. Yes, it's not only places where we get ideas, but that we can exchange those ideas and perhaps in a civil way learn how to not only exchange them, but then it then work together to find common ground and take action. Yes. So you can stand for both social justice and intellectual free freedom. The two are not mutually exclusive. Yes. Right, and, and perhaps not just stand, but help others to understand these key ideas. Yeah, this thumbs up to what Martin just said. Yes, okay. So, so here's some ideas that uh, I'll share with you that I have for what I think the roles can be. Certainly the civic space, you already got into that civic space issue. Um, when we had community conversations on our campus, Several people who participated said, you know, we really like coming together here at the library. It's a place that we do feel comfortable and welcome. So civic literacy, a little bit of what I talked about before, is trying to teach students uh, not only the kinds of information literacy skills that we prepare them for career and college success, but also for that third C, citizenship where they can learn not only how to find the information, but the kind of skills they need to exchange that information and, and learn how to work together with others as true citizens of our democracy. So convening forums, which is what we're talking about today, and that's deliberative uh, forums and dialogue, maybe a little different from the kind of forums you may have experienced in the past, and then also, partnering with our service learning and engaged scholarship initiatives on campus. And I got to tell you, I am working on an engaged scholarship um, project that was funded by OCLC and Elise with a colleague in our School of Communication Information, and it's been quite enlightening. And I think he benefits from my um, contributions as well as mine from his. So I want to give you some examples, some more examples. You heard a few already, but some examples about the kinds of things that are going on on campuses, particularly uh, between libraries and other uh, partners on campus, focusing on dialogue and deliberation. So here's Kansas State University Libraries, and I love the title or their byline on their um, 
uh, movies on the grass series, Talking in the Library, Case Staters United Against Shushing since 2006. So they have a film series where they uh, actually show films on the lawn. And uh, they are affiliated at the library with the Kansas State University Institute for Civic Discourse and Democracy, which is a Kettering-related center, of which we also have one in ALA, the ALA Center for Civic Life. So that center has been involved with helping them have dialogue about the films they're, wa they're watching. But also, the center was instrumental in um, having librarians train other librarians in public libraries around the state on the issue of the future of broadband in their communities. And they not only helped them uh, conduct forums, but they actually did what they call naming and training about issues around broadband deployment. And what we mean by that is capturing the shared concerns of citizens and defining the problem in public terms that are meaningful to citizens. And I'm going to show you a little bit about what a named and framed uh, topic looks like in a future slide. So here we have um, Oklahoma State University, another partnership where the Oklahoma State University Edmund Lowe Library partnered with the public library the public schools and the Oklahoma State Extension to do a series of um, forums uh, using the National Issues Forum Guide. So here's one on immigration. And I might add, they've got a new one coming out this month, which not soon enough on that topic. Um, they also did one on obesity, which topics that they determined were really important to their community. And here's Illinois State effort. Now, Illinois State effort was part of the um, ASCU's American Democracy Project. And they had a project on campus called Living Democracy. So they participated in various campus-wide projects like voter registration, service learning, uh, social issues fair. We just heard about um, social issues from some of you, um, and candidates debate. Um, but they also got involved in deliberative democracy, uh, deliberative forums. They trained staff to facilitate and record these forums. And they re led a research effort on, uh, on actually framing, naming and framing the Illinois budget issues. So they created their own issue guide based on what the public thinks about issues for uh, around the budget in Illinois. Um, and then they convene forums. So here's, uh, they also convene, convene forums on uh, what is the 21st century mi mission for our public schools. They did it in the community with the public library again, which is always a great partner in this work. So um, I'm, you're getting to see that there's lots of these uh, forum uh, books, uh, issue guides. They're available from the At National Issue Forum Institute. And you're going to hear from them uh, later in our webinar series. So here we are at Rutgers. So we did a, a whole series of projects at Rutgers to help us turn outward, as, uh, similar to uh, what you all did with uh, the Harwood Institute partnership with ALA um, in the Libraries Transform Community's first round of grants. Um, so we decided that we didn't want to just do uh, programs. We wanted to have more engaged kind of involvement with our community. So we brought in the voter registration vote, uh, tables. We held a constitutional cafe in partnership um, with our political science department. At uh, cafe, they were they got so many people that we we barely could fit in our uh, our scholar latte cafe in the library. But it was a very exciting uh, dialogue. Um, and then this involvement with the Darien Learning Community, which is the community that I worked with to help them on civic literacy. Now, what we also did though is we held some deliberative forums. So sorry that the picture is not better 
or it came out of our newspaper article about the forum. Um, this forum is particularly near and dear to my heart because um, it's on privacy, an issue I care about, but it was actually named and framed by members of the American Library Association. We went out all over the country and talked to people to find out how do they view, as citizens, not as experts, as citizens, the topic of privacy. So then we uh, framed it into these three approaches. You don't have to see all the details, but um, there's three approaches here, which is very typical in these forums. And we have held uh, several deliberative dialogues at the library. This is one at the library in our Pan-A room. Uh, several years ago, we did it during Banned Books Week as a way to call attention to the free speech issues around privacy. And it was very well received. Um, among the students in the class, I mean, in the, uh, in the room was a class from our, our library and information science program, as well as some students that were affiliated with the Eagleton Institute and others. Now, we not only um, have done deliberative forums using issue guides that are either framed nationally or framed by people at the National Issues Forums Institute and published and made available, we actually did our own naming and framing. And that's how we really got started in this work of turning outward. We asked the question, what is the future role for library liaisons? And I think for the last 10 years, uh, academic libraries have had trouble sort of deciding, where are we going? And so we started out by asking this question, and we named and framed the issue. We had a dialogue among our library staff. And it was not only a really interesting interaction, but it led us to all kinds of, of, of subsequent actions. So you can use a dialogue and deliberation for lots of purposes, both internally um, and externally. So before I turn, the mic back to coordinate. Let me just say that there really is, I think, no better time for us to be having uh, this webinar and this kind of conversation in our society that we all recognize that we need well-informed but also engaged uh, set of citizens that um, will be capable of addressing the complex issues facing our country. And that means we need to start when they're in school and really teach uh, students to, to take advantage of that opportunity. Um, through this program at ALA, I'm, I hope you'll learn some new ways to have these discussions on campus um, and also to enrich your liaison activities and build new partnerships uh, across, the, um, across your uh, colleges and universities. So let me turn back now the mic to Courtney, who's going to tell you more about the models for transforming communities that you can adopt as part of your practice um, as academic librarians. Courtney? Great. Thanks, Nancy. So um, before I dig into talking more about these models, um, you know, at this point in the conversation, we've talked about what engagement can look like um, and what you're currently doing to engage your campus and your community. Um, but let's just pause for a moment and talk about what's currently going on in your, uh, on your campus or, or again, in your community. Um, is there an issue that needs to be addressed? Is there a topic that has people buzzing? So, you know, please, a couple, I see DACA has already been thrown in there. Um, take a moment, think about this. Please feel free to share it in the chat with us now. Um, we won't be able to go too deep into them, but I think it'll be helpful for you to see what folks are bringing up. Um, I see boundaries of free speech, Nancy. Yes, absolutely. That is something that is um, very timely, I think, across the country right now, and certainly on our college campuses. Um, low enrollment and budget cuts, um, that is certainly something that I have seen with universities that I have both been a part of and uh, either working at or as a student, um, and, and many, many others. Um, and do feel free to continue to, to add those in there because I think it can be helpful for us to see what others, uh, what comes to mind for others. It might, might trigger something in your mind. Um, it's helpful to, to think about this a little bit before we proceed, um, just so you can keep these in mind as we go forward and think about how, um, 
how dialogue and deliberation and these models that we'll be introducing you to might be able to help you with these conversations on these topics. Great. I see a couple others I just want to call out there. Have engaged or not with trolls, that is a very uh, increasingly uh, interesting conversation to be having. White privilege and fragility, again, a topic that's very timely. Free speech versus hate speech, yeah, absolutely. I think these are, these are issues that are very much up right now and aren't going anywhere anytime soon. Um, so certainly, dialogue and deliberation are useful tools that can help people to come together to talk about these issues uh, and where appropriate, of course, make decisions together as well. So I just want to um, introduce you a little bit to dialogue and deliberation. Um, so the chart on your screen right now um, is a nice simple chart that lays out, um, you know, three different kinds of discourse. We have debate, which you're all, of course, I'm sure very familiar with, um, and oftentimes that's what we see most in our national discourse. Um, but what we're focusing on is dialogue and deliberation. And so dialogue, which you can see here in the middle com column, um, is really about an exchange of ideas or opinions where participants are coming together in person to share information, to share their perspectives, and the goal is really to seek greater understanding, whether it's of a topic or of one another, potentially both, um, and usually it's not calling for a decision to be made. So imagine people coming together to talk about their experiences on campus, perhaps related to their identities. Um, with a lot of what's going on in the world, particularly with, um, with hate speech and racial tensions. That could be something that's very timely. Um, these kinds of, but it's a deeply personal topic. And these kinds of topics can really lend themselves well to a dialogue where people can learn more about one another or an issue of importance to them, hear about how issues impact people as individuals um, without feeling pressed towards having to make some decision or take some action about something. It really just gives people a chance to connect on a new level. Now, deliberation, as you see in the right column here, is also about an exchange of ideas, but it goes a step further in really pushing us to make those choices. So at the heart of deliberation is weighing possible actions and decisions very carefully by examining the benefits, costs, and consequences in light of what is most valuable to each of us. The deliberation aims for us to find areas of common ground, which can then develop into plans for action or decisions. The so deliberation is a really great tool for situations where there's no easy answer or solution to the problem. You really need to wrestle with it and talk with everyone and get a better sense of what can we do together. So imagine people coming together to talk about an issue such as how to address climate change. This is an issue with many perspectives um, and certainly many potential actions that we could take to address it. And, and making a decision together is going to take some hard examination of the options available. So deliberation provides this kind of process for that, that kind of decision um, making. It's a great approach for discussing, discussing issues we might talk about in the classroom, for instance, um, and for engaging people's different um, knowledge, experience, and values to examine what we might do together. Yes, and Nancy chimed in, we call them wicked problems. When there's no easy answer or solution, those are wicked problems. So NCDD recently asked our network about their experiences working with libraries. And I just wanted to share this quote with you from Jen Wilding of Consensus, which is a nonprofit in Kansas City. She wrote to us that I would recommend that a library use D&D, Dialogue and Deliberation. It seems really useful for two situations. One, giving people the chance to talk about challenging national issues like the war in Iraq. And two, allowing people to discuss local issues or the local space of a national issue. It's the kind of event that local residents expect from the library in that it isn't advocacy, but rather it's an opportunity to learn and think through an issue. Dialogue and deliberation make people feel more connected to their community. They also help people feel more connected to those whose views and experiences are different from their own because it provides space to really hear from one another and understand one another better. 
They're also a natural addition to your current programming. So think about, you know, some of you have mentioned, and certainly we heard in the pre-survey, um, you host speakers panels or other programs that are informing participants about a topic. So imagine adding a dialogue or deliberation component to get people in the room talking about that topic with one another. Um, these processes, again, can be great additions to your programming without requiring too much more work. You already got people in the room, so why not get them talking, right? So I wanted to share with you this graphic here, which is based on a report um, also from Martin Carcasson. You'll, you'll hear us say his name several times, um, and yes, he is one of the workshop presenters for the National Issues Forum pre-conference workshop in February. Um, and we just shared the link to this resource in NCZ's Resource Center with you now in the chat. But this graphic pictured here outlines three types of goals for engagement work. And there's really three tiers. So the, the first tier, the first order goals are individual and knowledge-based goals. Although these, um, these goals like issue learning and improved democratic act attitudes are often discounted, um, they really still impact the, the bigger picture um, and these second and third order goals of increasing community civic capacity and ability to solve problems. From the examples that you shared with us earlier, certainly it's clear that libraries are already achieving these. Your outreach work for certain falls into this first order. Um, you know, you are helping people learn about issues and you are improving relationships. You're already hitting those for sure. The second order goals are um, more immediate group and community outcomes. So, and it gets a little more complex as you go through each order. Um, but they build upon one another. So, you know, beyond issue learning and improving your relationships, that then builds to help you transform your conflicts um, and move towards more collective action. And that ultimately gets you to your third order goals, which are really community change and longer term capacity building. And what you get to when you get at these third or, third order goals is more of building a culture of engagement and increasing individuals as well as community capacity for, um, for, for community problem solving and, and for, of course, civic engagement. And I would say certainly, as highlighted by Nancy just a few moments ago, many libraries are certainly achieving these second and third order goals already. And actually, Nancy, I'd be curious um, to hear from you if you want to chime in here about where you think Rutgers has gone on this continuum. Well, thanks, Courtney. Well, certainly Rutgers has gotten started on the first order. I wish I wish we could say we're moving up in toward the right, but I, I think that we're just getting really started with the, the learning, but the improved democratic attitudes and skills. And one of the things that's so um, vital when you participate in a deliberative forum is you go from your own personal ideas about the issue um, or looking at those people and what they think to coming together to think about what we care about together. And that moving from them to I to we is mm -hmm. really part of, de of developing these uh, democratic attitudes and skills. And I think they're really important uh, to teach young people as well as learn. You know, it would be nice if they were learned across the board all the way up to uh, the top of our government. So, but the, um, the other areas, I think we're doing some work in libraries uh, moving forward uh, with the work we did with the Harwood Institute and the Libraries Transform Communities is really building that capacity within a community to take action together. And I hope that uh, we can all get to that point at some point. But, you know, starting at the, on the left side is a really important place to at least begin. Mm -hmm. Certainly, yeah, thanks, Nancy. And I, I would add to that, um, I had a conversation with, um, uh, with a librarian at the University of Illinois um, in preparation for this forum. And one of the, the takeaways he shared with me from his experience uh, incorporating deliberation uh, into their work was that, you know, really within these first order goals, information literacy is such a big part of that. Um, and it's such an important role that the library plays 
Um, but what he added to it was, you know, what deliberation offers is really a chance to get closer to those second order goals, um, to go from information literacy to, you know, not only can we assess and evaluate information that comes into us, but we can then also talk about it with others um, and find, you know, productive ways to share the information that we have as well as our values um, and really work through our differences. All right, so if you are looking to proceed with putting together dialogue, um, there are a couple key pieces to figure out to help you succeed. And certainly we'll get into these more deeply in the um, subsequent uh, webinars, but just wanna touch on these briefly for you. Um, and those really boil down to three things. The first thing is a timely topic. Um, so your topic helps get people in the door, it enlivens the conversation, and it increases the likelihood of personal or certainly collective action. You wanna pick something that feels relevant to the community and will really you know, encourage people to participate. So some of those topics you brought up, um, free speech um, and DACA and so on, those are topics that a lot of people wanna talk about right now. Certainly timely topics that are primed for dialogue or deliberation. You want to put together a set of ground rules. So every good dialogue and deliberation process includes a basic set of ground rules. I'll show you an example of those in a moment. These really help form an agreement for how everyone will participate and set the expectations for decorum. And then finally, you want to pick your process and a facilitator. Um, so for each process, you need someone to help facilitate that dialogue. This may be a role that once you go through this webinar series, you feel comfortable stepping into, um, or you might wanna bring someone else in to facilitate. If you're looking for, and just as an aside, um, if you're looking for additional support after this series is over, um, NCBB and our network is a great resource to you. And so again, I just wanna highlight that. Um, you saw our map earlier, we shared the link for you. Um, there's lots of people out there who are very experienced in facilitation and will be willing to talk with you, work with you, and so on. So choosing your topic. You want to, as I said before, really make sure that it's a topic that um, addresses the needs and interests of your participants. So, you know, thinking about really what's in it for the participants. Is this something that is going to grab them right now? And so I share this um, quote from Carolyn Kaywood. He's a retired librarian from Virginia Beach um, who has a real focus on civic engagement and also is a long, long time NCDD member. Um, and so she wrote to me, if the library thinks the community should care about an issue but has not asked what the community thinks, it may be a waste of resources. My partner and I put a lot of effort into developing a conversation framework and no one came. Since then, we've pulled the public on the topics they want to discuss and we've had much better results. So I, I encourage you to, you know, do a little research to determine where the community is in relation to some topics that you're interested in talking about. Um, you know, think about our, and, and look into, are others on campus already trying to address this issue or talk about it? Are there groups in the community or other leaders who have knowledge or experience related to the topic? Um, these can make fantastic partners uh, for you, by the way. On campus, this could also mean reaching out to faculty about what their courses focus on in the coming semester. Are there opportunities to connect the course content to a dialogue, for instance. Get to know who on campus can also share insights into current campus conflicts or different conversations that are ongoing. Um, and you can find some timely topics that way as well. Okay. Ground rules. So ground rules are helpful for setting that decorum for your engagement that I mentioned before. This example here is actually from the National Issues Forums model. Um, and as you can see, the ground rules here really focus on both encouraging respectful conversation. Um, you'll see here that they mention um, everyone is encouraged to participate, no one dominates. The, discuss the, the, the discussion stays focused on the issue at hand um, and listening as, is as important for talking. Those really all get at 
you know, what it takes to have a respectful and productive conversation. The ground rules also really charge the group with doing the work that the process is set to do. So as you see here, this process, um, it mentions all three approaches are fairly considered. Um, so, you know, this forum is really about discussing three possible approaches to address an issue um, and trying to identify a direction to take. And so that goes to the last bullet point there, work towards making a decision. Those ground rules help set up these expectations for what are gonna happen in the dialogue. And it helps people be a little more clear on what they're going to be doing. And finally, pick a process. So your decision of what kind of model for engagement you want to use should be based on your intent, the resources that you have, and the needs, of course, of your potential, potential participants. And you can use NCDD's engagement streams framework to pinpoint what kind of model might work best for you. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that now. So this image you see here, uh, and we're linking uh, to this on our website as well now in the chat, um, is this is really just a nice little um, graphic of NCDD's streams, engagement streams of practice. Um, the engagement streams is something that was developed collaboratively with members of our network uh, to categorize the many different models for dialogue and deliberation into four main streams based on their primary intention or purpose um, and of course, it notes which of the methods fall within each of the streams. So I just wanna to touch briefly on each of these now to give you a sense of really what's out there when we talk about dialogue and deliberation. So the first is exploration, that's in your top left-hand corner. And exploration is about encouraging community members to learn more about themselves, their community, or an issue. And so this can be helpful when a community needs to reflect and gain collective insights or to make new connections to one another. Um, someone earlier mentioned that a community center was having issues with longer time members um, welcoming in newer members. Um, you know, this could be an exploration model could be good for helping to bring those people closer together. Um, but exploration processes don't necessarily need to require a decision being made. So they really fall more in that kind of peer dialogue um, approach that I was mentioning before. So think about picking a topic here that allows for exploration of the issue um, or participants' perspectives on the topic. If we go back to the example that I mentioned much earlier from the University of Michigan um, about multiracial experience, um, you know, you might have a dialogue that asks, what has been your experience with multiracialism on campus? Or what do we want this experience to look like in our community? These questions don't necessarily require that a decision be made in the dialogue, but they really generate good conversation amongst participants. So the second stream is at the top right of your screen is conflict transformation. These approaches create safe space for resolving conflicts, building trust, and improving relations in a community. They can be really useful when healing is needed after a crisis or a trauma occurs. So the dialogue about political polarization um, or race relations can fit well within this stream, especially if it's something that's going on in your community. Um, these are conversations where they really call for um, people of different perspectives or those in conflict with one another um, to come together in safe space where they can build trust. The fourth engagement stream is decision-making. You'll see that in the lower left-hand corner. Those models are used to involve a community in influencing or making decisions about a policy or another issue. They are about deliberating, examining those options, and coming to a decision or direction for the community or governing body in charge to implement. These models are good for topics like climate change, where a decision about what to, need, what to do really needs to come from a close examination of the options. This stream can also be used to start the community in thinking about these issues and the different choices available. So certainly the National Issues Forum's model falls into this decision-making um, stream. You've heard us talk a, little, a lot about the topics um, and how that works. So that's really, that pure deliberation really falls into that decision-making stream. 
And last but certainly not least um, is the collaborative action stream. Uh, collaborative action empowers communities to solve problems and take collective responsibility for uh, action. It's often a good approach to use when multiple entities or many stakeholders are involved or need to be part of a solution to a problem. Responding to crises in the community can be uh, suited well by this approach as it brings community members together to determine how to solve problems and work together on solutions. So this image overall just overviews the engagement streams framework and I've really touched on it very quickly. Um, the, the framework itself is much more comprehensive. Um, we have a great chart online that includes information about each of these streams in more detail along with about a couple dozen methods um, that fall within these streams. So that link that's been shared in the chat um, is where you can go to find more information about that. Um, in this Models for Change uh, initiative, we are covering six different models, each um, uh, touching on each of these streams in the entirety of the, the initiative. Um, in this series for academic libraries, we're featuring, of course, two models. Uh, and so I want to introduce you to each of those now. So our first partner in this series is Essential Partners very aptly named, um, and we will be featuring their method, which is called Reflective Structured Dialogue. So Reflective Structured Dialogue helps people with fundamental disagreements over divisive issues and um, helps them to develop mutual understanding and trust. It enables participants to share experiences and to help them become more comfortable around, uh, as well as curious about those with whom they are in conflict. Uh, or they don't see eye to eye. This model falls into that conflict transformation stream that I just talked about. So we chose this model for academic libraries because it can help a campus community to engage deeply with one another on issues where there is great tension and can also serve as a tool for thorough exploration of diverse perspectives on an issue. So one way that Essential Partners approach has been used um, on a college campus is, um, comes from Clark University in Massachusetts, um, who incorporated reflective structured dialogue into their difficult dialogues program uh, to address diversity and inclusion issues on campus. Uh, specifically in this case, they held a dialogue focused on the challenges faced by transgender, transsexual, and intersex individuals. So they held um, a community conversation with 60 people, which included students, faculty, staff, uh, and members of the community. This image is actually from um, that meeting at Clark. Uh, and following some remarks from a professor and a facilitator, everyone broke into smaller circles for a small group dialogue, which was guided by a set of questions and actually facilitated in each group by a Clark student. The community conversation that night allowed people to really deeply explore what it means to have a gender. People were able to be honest with one another without being hurtful um, because they used this reflective structured dialogue approach. So this is just one way that this approach can really help you to dig into some of those, those deeper, more personal, sometimes divisive issues um, that really call for a, a really thorough, deep dialogue. Our second partner in this series, um, and we've certainly mentioned them several times, is National Issues Forums. Um, National Issues Forums offer people the opportunity to join together to deliberate to make choices with one another about ways to approach difficult issues and to work towards identifying common ground for action. And you'll learn a lot more about what we mean when we say common ground for action in the subsequent webinar on National Issues Forums. In this model, participants deliberate on several possible approaches to the issue at hand. Every approach comes with a set of costs and consequences that must be thoroughly measured. Only then do you know which costs participants, of course, are willing to bear. We chose this model for the Academic Library Series um, as certainly it's already a model used in universities across the country, um, which is used to engage students in the broader campus community. Uh, it also makes a great complement to other offerings such as lectures and panels and so on. 
And you heard Nancy mention this before, but um, just an example of how national issues forms have been incorporated um, use in, involving a library is the Movies on the Graph series from Kansas State University librarians who work, of course, with the Institute for Civic Discourse and Democracy, which is on campus. Um, so they've created this outdoor film festival and it's been going on for quite a while now. If you look on their website, and we just shared the link in the chat, um, you can actually see the list of, of the films that they've shown for the past several years. Um, and they've really built this into a, a great program uh, that, you know, both introduces people to provocative films um, as well as engages them in, in dialogue and deliberation uh, about the topics that are presented in these films. And the librarians at, at KSU have partnered with faculty um, at, as well as many community partners. Their website also shows you um, the, uh, the different partners that they've made most recently. Um, and so this image is from actually their film screening they just held this past Sunday. They showed Before the Flood, which you um, may know about. It's a, a film that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio was behind. Um, it talks about climate change issues. And, um, and so they brought people together to, to hear that and to, to have a conversation. All right. So we've heard in this webinar about what you are currently doing. We've talked about topics that might be primed for engagement. And we've introduced you to dialogue and deliberation um, and how they can help to enhance your engagement goals. So I'd like to, before we get into some resources and questions and all of that, just take a couple minutes to think about how this might play out at your institution. So having listened to us talk about what's been done, what's possible, um, and what we're really going to be teaching you more about, do you have any ideas on how you could see this playing out at your institution? Um, so take a minute to think about that, and I certainly welcome you to share your thoughts in the chat. And I'll welcome, welcome you, Nancy, as well, um, to join me at this point if you want to talk about some, some thoughts you have on how this can play out. Also, Courtney, uh, this is Mary. And um, while folks are getting their thoughts together, I do want to just quickly um, explain a couple of things. Um, Certainly. In terms of available, we'll go back to the resources, but to let you know that registration is open now for the workshop at midwinter. I saw a comment on, in the chat that said that the uh, link is not active. If you look under ticketed events, um, there is sort of an alternate path to register for this free, for this free workshop. Um, and in order to register for the workshop, you do need to view all of the webinars in this series as well as claim your badges from the Credly site. And I will put this slide up again at the end of the webinar, but I wanted to address that concern now while you're all getting your thoughts together. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Mary. And I meant to mention, too, just um, because you're looking at this slide with this, this image clearly with students on it, um, this is, because you haven't heard Nancy and I mention Martine Carcasson enough, um, this is actually an image of Martine and his students um, back in 2012. Um, we did a little project where we asked people to describe what they do, and so this says, we are students working toward a more perfect union. I just want to share that with you. All right, so we have one uh, contribution so far. It says we already have a lot of programs on our campus, and we can collaborate with people planning events to develop displays, et cetera, in the library. Yeah, certainly. I, I always encourage um, looking for areas for collaboration, folks that you can partner with. Um, you know, it certainly helps not have to create something from scratch, but to build something off of what's already kind of in the works or on, ongoing on campus, right? And Laura here has chimed in with encouraging more audience participation after programs rather than just the Q&A to encourage dialogue and deliberation. Yeah, certainly. I think that's, that's one of the, you know, great compliments. Um, if you're holding a program, 
changing up the process to, to kind of turn the tables on folks and ask them to talk amongst one another instead of just engaging with a, a presenter or a panel is always a great way to kind of, you know, build that engagement on your, your community, your campus. Nancy, were you going to jump in? I didn't mean to yeah, cut you I, off. Yeah, I was going to suggest that um, there's all kinds of handles you can get on this work, but one of them is uh, celebrating particular events. So Constitution Day is coming up. When I was at Penn State on Constitution Day, they had deliberative dialogue uh, forums all over campus, and the communication students were taught how to uh, moderate, and the um, Students in some of the writing classes to help to name and frame issues, or they used uh, the National Issues Forum uh, guides. So they used that as an opportunity. Ban Books Week, uh, uh, Choose Privacy Week in the spring, uh, National Library Week, the Bill of Rights Day in, I think, December. You know, so you can use events, you can use opportunities that um, somebody already said about partnerships going on on campus. Um, oh, we're having an event at Penn State Abington. Go Penn State Abington. Great, yeah. <laughs> um, so if you can sort of either pick some other things going on or use your own interest in having a celebration or an engagement rather than an expert panel, you know, uh, let, let students be the experts and turn toward each other and have this dialogue. Um, it's all wonderful opportunities for you to jump in. Definitely. That's great. Well, we're, we're starting to get towards the end of our time. Um, and so, you know, certainly um, it's a bit of a challenge to, you know, jump in and say, all right, how might this play out? We've, we've just been talking, you know, to you for uh, an hour and 15 minutes. Um, and it might take some time to figure that out, but, you know, hopefully this will get some juices flowing. And as you get into these subsequent webinars, um, you know, you'll get more deeper into these two models and you'll really be able to see what's possible when you use them uh, for engagement. So I want to talk a little bit about some resources for you, but I also encourage you, because we are getting to that time, if you have questions that are emerging, to put those in the chat so that we can start to draw on those um, in the, the remaining time that we have. Um, but just a, a couple resources as you go um, out of today's webinar and move forward, and hopefully you'll participate in our remaining two webinars, um, and hopefully we'll see many of you at the uh, pre-conference workshop in February as well. Um, but several resources available to you. Um, of course, the ALA Libraries Transforming Communities website, um, and Samantha is adding these links in for you now for easy access. Um, ALA's LTC listserv is also available to you. Um, you can join with that uh, email address there. Uh, NCDD has a resource center. Um, the resource center has over 3,000 resources available to you. Those include journals and publications. They include issue guides, so um, those national issues forums. Um, guides that we talked about, and Nancy showed you some of them on her slides. Um, we have, you know, most if not all of those on there you can check out. Um, the LTC site also has resources that we've begun to um, put together for libraries in this series, so you can check those out there as well. Uh, one of the key resources that I'd point you to on NCDD's site is our beginner's guide. Um, so this is really kind of the, the best resource for you as you get started. Um, it has lots of great stuff. Uh, it has information on ground rules. It has information on uh, asking good questions. It links you up to that engagement streams framework and the goals of D&D and so on. Um, so that's, you know, really kind of my first place to go. If you're a beginner and just starting to explore, check out our beginner's guide. Um, also wanted to point you to the ALA Center for Civic Life page. Nancy mentioned that. Um, there's a lot of great resources over there, including um, the next link, which is the webinar series that I believe was put together in 2012, Nancy. Um, and maybe you could just mention briefly 
what you all covered in that series, so folks know that that's there as well. Right, yeah, we did a series over a, a couple of years, from 2012 to 2014, I think, mm -hmm. um, on how to moderate, how to convene for them, um, issue books and how to use them, and then I think the, um, a really extraordinary contribution we made was how to name and frame that we did with the Alabama David Matthews Center for Civic Life. And many of our partners on uh, those webinars are people whose names you've seen today, people like Patty Deneen, who works with the National Issues Forum, Ellen Knudsen, who you'll see uh, later um, in the semester. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, um, those webinars, you can just take a look at for an hour each, so they're not too long, and they take you step by step um, to learn how to do this work, how to monitor, um, how to name and frame. And so very skill focused and hopefully you'll tune into them. Great. All right. And then this final resource, Mary, perhaps you can you can speak to this one here. Sure. Um so a couple of things. Um, one, Courtney, why don't you pass me back that ball and I'll you got it. slides. But we do have a question from Robin Keir uh, asking how dialogue and deliberation is related to intergroup dialogue. If you have just uh, time to quickly um, respond to that, that would be great. Of course. Yeah, so um, intergroup dialogue is certainly part of um, the broader dialogue and deliberation sphere, if you will. So I, I introduced you to dialogue and deliberation today as very, you know, two kind of um, approaches. Um, but within each of those, there are many different models and approaches to them. Um, you know, so for, for instance, within dialogue, um, we have intergroup dialogue, we have um, models like World Cafe, which was featured in our public uh, library series, uh, our first public library series. Um, you have many different approaches that fall within there. Within deliberation, you have different models, like the National Issues Forums really falls into uh, deliberation, um, and you have others that, that are kind of similar in, um, in their goals. So um, everyday democracies approach uh, dialogue to action, um, really kind of fits both dialogue and deliberation together and weaves it into a, a collaborative action um, type of model. And that was the other model that we, um, we've already introduced you to in the public library series. So intergroup dialogue is, is a part of, um, of all of this. It's just a specific way of approaching dialogue um, based on either certain um, needs, certain topics, certain um, uh, you know, groups of people you'd be engaging. Fantastic. Thanks, Courtney. Uh, and it looks like Robin found that helpful, so good. Um, I want to go back just for a second. The last listing here on resources is the Libraries Foster Community Engagement Member Interest Group. That is an ALA member interest group. For those of you who are active in Connect, either the present form or the soon to be rolled out new form, it's ALA's sort of um, member workspace. Uh, that is an online community, but it is also a uh, group that convenes at conferences. Nancy generally chairs those groups, uh, the convenings for those groups uh, at midwinter and annual. So check the, um, the conference listings for those meetings. And if you're on the um, list serve, you'll receive notices of those as well. Um, I also just want to entreat you all to please complete the post-webinar uh, survey monkey that you'll receive so that we can learn from your experiences and um, keep delivering these resources at a relatively high level. Um, and also, again, some details about registration. Registration for the webinars in this series are, all, are open right now. The next one is coming up on October 11th, almost a month away, um, with Essential Partners. And there is a third one on November 15th. And the registration for the workshop led by National Issues Forums at ALA Midwinter in Denver in February 
is open. Samantha is posting the direct link for that. It is also listed on ticketed events in the ALA Midwinter site. Um, they're just launching launched that site today at noon, so if there are any glitches, it sounds like some of you ran into some, I'm quite sure they will be resolved within the next day <laughs> or so, probably. Please know that in order to be eligible to participate in the free workshop at midwinter, you must register and participate in all the webinars. You must go to Credly and claim a badge following your participation in all the webinars. So for instance, your badge for this webinar is available now, LTC Academic 1 is the code, and that is how we will be able to verify uh, your participation in this series and move you into the participant slot for the in-person webinar. Uh, the last webinar we did was completely uh, filled very quickly. I'm sorry, the last in-person workshop was completely filled very quickly. So um, we want to make sure that uh, everyone who's there is on the same page in terms of access to those resources. Um, the deadline for claiming all of your badges to be eligible for participation in the in-person workshop is January 9th, 2018. I'm just going to pause and take a pause for a second to see if there are any additional questions with all of that information. And go back maybe to the badge slide. That usually is one that everyone needs. Um, while we wind up here, um, I want to thank all of you so much for making the time to participate in this webinar and for your excellent questions and sharing with us and each other uh, your efforts in this, in dialogue and deliberation and deep engagement with your campus and larger communities. I want to thank also our presenters, um, Courtney Breeze from the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation and Nancy Cronick from Rutgers University and um, all things libraries. Her footprint is wide and far. Our thanks as well to the Institute for Museum and Library Services, to ACRL, PLA, and our Models for Change advisory group for their guidance. I'd also like to thank my colleagues behind the scenes, Eloa Sharp from ACRL, Samantha Oakley, Brian Russell, and Sarah Osman from the ALA Public Programs Office. They've all been so supportive of this webinar and this series and libraries transforming communities models for change as an initiative. I'm going to pause just another moment to see if there are any last questions. Okay. Uh, then I'm going to um, say that this learning webinar has been a part of ALA's Libraries Transforming Communities Initiative, which addresses a critical need within the library field by developing and distributing tools and resources to support the work of engaging communities in innovative ways. I really hope that uh, we will see all of you in the coming months on these webinars and that we will hear from you and about your endeavors. We're able to learn and share your experiences um, with the field throughout this entire process. And we're very grateful for your participation. Thank you all.